my policy tends to be don't trust Wall Street giants. They become that powerful on Wall Street. They are pretty cutthroat and criminal because that's how you rise to the top of that particular sphere. Look at how Larry Fink has been behaving over the past like two-ish years. It just identifies how much money laundering there is being done in the world. We have been part of a huge revolution in investing through ETFs. He was known as a big ESG guy, right? And then he uh, openly abandoned the ESG terminology and straight up said that climate finance, green finance, all of that stuff he's involved in is about profits, not about wokeness or saving the planet or whatever. And since then has also 180'd his stance on Bitcoin and has essentially changed a lot of his talking points, which I think is very notable. Today we have Whitney Webb discussing Bitcoin and cryptocurrency and why we're in for a rude awakening very soon. The recent approval of BlackRock's Bitcoin ETF was only the beginning. As more financial institutions and governments invest into spot ETFs, Whitney points out the underlying plan to use Bitcoin and cryptocurrency as a means to control the supply. She discusses why very soon, cryptocurrency will be used as a way to destroy the value and privacy that's eluded governments until now. She says we're witnessing the collapse of the fiat money system and why this is unlike anything we've seen in history. While the dollar may be the last one to fall, there's something much bigger going on behind the scenes. Let's get right into the video with Whitney Webb as she gives her prediction for what's coming in the days and weeks ahead. The first time I really wrote meaningfully about Larry Fink was probably a few years ago uh, in relations to the Glasgow Financial Alliance for Net Zero, uh, where Larry Fink is a principal. It's like a UN uh, sponsored organization that was co-founded uh, by Mark Carney, former head of the Bank of England and later Bank of Canada, former Goldman Sachs. Um, and uh, also Mike Bloomberg is a big figure there, the New York, former mayor of New York and a well-known billionaire who, you know, started off at Solomon Brothers. So these are essentially bankers um, developing what amounts to a major component of UN-sponsored uh, policy directly related to their, you know, their climate change policies. And um, basically what GFANS proposes is creating a new financial governance system, uh, seizing what they call the new Bretton Woods move, uh, moment, uh, basically, you know, recreating the global financial system and also reimagining the multilateral development banks uh, like the World Bank, the IMF, et cetera, which came out of actual Bretton Woods. Right. So they want to move all of that into a new paradigm. Uh, Larry Fink's been particularly vocal about that. And what GFANS proposes specifically is merging the members of GFANS with the multilateral development banks as a way to basically use the same debt slavery model that the MDBs have been criticized for using. But instead of using it to further uh, U.S. empire uh, or the dollar and, and things of that nature, it's instead uh, the, the proposal is to use it to create um, better enabling environments in countries for the green investments of these large financial institutions and asset managers. So it's it's basically like perpetuating the same uh, model of the MDBs, but having basically Wall Street run it uh, under the guise that it's a planetary necessity uh, and that we can't get to net zero without this, which uh, frankly, if you look into the explanations for that, there's no way that's the case. Uh, but that's, you know, how I first start uh, started writing about Larry Fink uh, was because of this his involvement in this uh, relatively open plan to create a new financial system, which, uh, among other things, doesn't just rest on the MDBs, but also on the development of global carbon markets, uh, which comes up in this uh, this particular piece in a pretty meaningful way. Well, Larry Fink is someone who's obviously a member of the elite, and he's also a person who, throughout his entire career, has been pretty obsessed with risk management. So I think, you know, whatever this new financial system is, it's... Um, that he is, you know, part of this group propo that, that's proposing this, um, ultimately is about trying to uh, enable BlackRock to continue its massive expansion to own, you know, essentially everything uh, with, you know, uh, as little risk to them as possible, um, which uh, obviously a lot of the stuff that Fink is pushing for is part of this broader 
a system that the world's being pushed into under the guise of sustainable development that includes things like digital IDs and, and carbon markets and all of that, setting something up where it's uh, very, uh, very diff will be very difficult to challenge uh, BlackRock's financial uh, prominence and dominance, really, and uh, anything that Fink and others would view as a risk to, uh, you know, their current trajectory, I guess, uh, they don't really have to worry about people like uh, people or movements like that uh, as they mm. enter in, enter into and sort of impose upon us this, uh, these new systems, which includes, you know, some of these forms of digital control, uh, like the CBDC and their private sector equivalents, for example, programmable, surveillable money, um, and, you know, tied into the digital ID thing. All of this, as, as is noted in the article, is meant to interface with uh, you know, global carbon markets and the multilateral development banks that Fink has been targeting in particular um, through GFANS and, and also uh, BlackRock itself has been pretty focused on them. Um, you know, they're seeking to, uh, the, the World Bank is developing climate wallet functionality and a lot of this other infrastructure on which uh, uh, global carbon markets would rely and are also um, sort of uh, attempting to become the the main data storage for the digital ID system uh, as well. So a lot of big moves are being made uh, through these institutions for part of this new global financial governance system, as GFANS calls it. Webb warns against the entry of powerful financial institutions like BlackRock into the Bitcoin space, saying this is definitely a negative development in crypto. She asserts that these institutions are set to control a significant portion of the cryptocurrency supply and emphasizes the importance of resisting this obvious influence on the market. Larry Fink, among other things, is on the board of trustees of the World Economic Forum. And I think the World Economic Forum is misunderstood by a lot of people and people use certain terms to refer to what they are and what they do. But ultimately what that group is, is about advancing the public-private partnership model and of course, there's two sides to that, much like there is in the in the prevailing left right paradigm of of most countries politics. Um, and, you know, for a long time, they've leaned sort of on the public side and used talking points that are meant to appeal to the political left um, and have gotten a lot of pushback as a result. And so if you notice, people like Fink, but other people as well have moved their met re uh, their rhetoric away from those seeking to appeal to the political left uh, in the public side of the public-private partnership, leaning into the private aspect of the public-private partnership and having more right-leaning talking points, but ultimately all are trying to lead you to the same exact system of digital ID, programmable, surveillable money, uh, and global carbon markets. Um, and I think, uh, you know, the carbon market in particular, it's sort of hard to extricate that from the climate change, um, you know, situation. But I think uh, it looks like, you know, people like Fink and some of the people in that particular space are going to attempt to market it as something that uh, can make people very wealthy or allow them to uh, get quick access to capital by uh, tokenizing their land holdings and like fractionalizing their private property, um, using uh, different things that haven't been able to be financialized before and, and, and then bringing that on chain and using that as collateral, receiving loans that way and all of that. There's a lot of um, ambitious plans in that particular space. Um, and aside from that, um, there's been this push uh, led by the Rock Rockefeller Foundation and some other groups through this whole push um, through for natural asset corporations where they basically openly talk about the idea to expand the amount of assets in the existing financial system by like five or six fold by incorporating what they refer to as natural assets so this is sort of like the financializing of the natural world and, and turning uh allowing people to sell ecosystem services and, and all of that. And, uh, you know, this is part of the broader effort to to usher in a, a global carbon market. So anyway, um, I think it's interesting that there's a lot of this shift going on. I think it's a big um, part of why someone like Javier Malay was given the main stage at WEF and then openly praised by the WEF that he was, the WEF elites that he was supposedly scolding in that speech. Uh, they, they very much embraced, uh, you know, Malay's vision and we're like, yeah, we should have the private sector lead the public-private partnerships and all of that. But ultimately, the public and the private, as represented within the WEF, agree about the plan. Um, maybe there's, uh, you know, how that how it's implemented or how it's sold to people. There maybe there's differences there, but ultimately they agree about where we're going in terms of like digital ID 
um, you know, global, a global ledger and, and all of this stuff, uh, programmable, surveillable money, whether it's private sector issued or central bank issued, you know, ultimately the, the end results are, are somewhat the same, but there's a, an effort to sort of change the sales pitch. I just want to sort of underscore the idea that it, there's a historical precedent, specifically in the U.S., for when they attempt to, like, pitch a particular policy or create a particular entity. Uh, if it gets pushed back as being openly part of the government, they privatize it and then no one complains. People, um, you know, think because of the rhetoric that, oh, this is you know, everything's being handed back to the free market. But, but these companies, Palantir being an example, you know, that was set up with state involvement, CIA involvement, right? So it's not really the free market, it's cronyism, it's crony capitalism, it's cartelism. And so with someone like Malay being like, yeah, I'm going to hand stuff off to the private sector, it's not like it's going to the Argentine private sector, it's going to foreign uh, members of a global banking cartel that includes some of the biggest in institutions on Wall Street that have a verifiable documented history of, of corruption. Webb foresees a looming economic catastrophe driven by collapsing fiat money systems, rampant inflation and bank failures. She suggests transitioning to a Bitcoin standard as the world grapples with the impending crisis. She asserts that the promises made by the Federal Reserve and central banks have been hollow leading to excessive money printing and a proliferation of poor investments. And with the aftermath of the recent inflation surge, Webb says this will not lead to a return to the status quo. What do you think about her prediction for Bitcoin and where we're headed in the first half of 2024? Comment down below. Thanks so much for watching. Don't forget to like and subscribe. This is Library of Wealth. We'll see you in the next video.